Hi everyone, my name is Laura Edelson and I'm a PhD candidate at NYU. Today I'm going to be talking about our security analysis of Facebook's political ad library. I did this work with Tobias Lauinger and Damon McCoy, both of New York University as well. So I wanted to start by discussing what motivated this work. It's well understood that in 2016, Russia attempted to interfere in the US presidential election by covertly promoting the candidacy of Donald Trump and by encouraging voters not likely to vote for Trump to not vote at all. So in practice, that looks like a wide range of things. Here, it's promoting Bernie Sanders and it's anti-Hillary. Here, it's pro-police officers and gun rights. And here, it's anti-Donald Trump and promoting the African-American community. Because of all this, in the summer of 2018, Facebook implemented new policies around political advertising. In the United States, advertisers are required to disclose ads about social issues, elections, or politics, and they must provide an accurate disclosure string naming the entity that paid for the ad, conforming to a standard format. Facebook makes ads on those topics transparent through its ad library, with an overall aim to have enough transparency that third-party groups can act and users aren't misled about who is paying to show them ads. In the Facebook ad library, ads are made available through both a web portal and an API, and the API is accessible to any ID-verified user who agrees to the term of service. For each ad, we can get the ad creative text, some bucketed data about impression and spend, as well as the demographic and geographic spread of the spend. We also get some metadata about when the ad ran and the disclosure string and page that the ad ran against. Facebook also publishes an ad library report every day for several time periods with summary information about how much each page and disclosure string combination has spent and their total number of active ads over the time period of the report. Okay, moving on to how we collected all this data. In order to maintain as complete a copy of the ad library as possible, our data collection process is as follows. We start by collecting the Facebook ad library report with a scraper. Then with the Facebook ad library report for a given period, we query the ad library API for all the advertisers with active ads during the period. We then write all the ads we collect to our database. Then we validate our data sets by comparing our data to the most recent Facebook ad library report. We were largely but not entirely successful in creating an exact copy of Facebook's ad library. When we compare our data to what Facebook reports for the study period, we are missing about 10,000 ads in total. However, we also have an additional 7,000 ads that we can't find reported in the ad library reports. This is all off of a basis of about 3.7 million ads. So I need to talk briefly about why we were not able to create an exact copy of the Facebook ad library. This is because ads can be made irretrievable for several reasons. Some of those reasons will also remove the ads from the ad library report, but others will not. First, ads can be removed from the ad library if the advertiser disputes its inclusion. When this happens, the ad is removed from the ad library report summary data as well. Second, ads can be removed if the ad library's inclusion policy changes and the ad is no longer covered by the inclusion policy. This happened twice during the study period. Once, a policy change retroactively declared a grace period for disclosure between May 7th and May 24th and removed undisclosed ads from this period. Second, a policy change in April 2019 made ads from news providers exempt from transparency requirements. Third, there just appear to be a small number of ads that are not retrievable for unknown technical reasons. The main point that I want to stress here is that the ad library is not an archive, and it's a mistake to think of it as such. So now that we have all this data, we can start asking questions. We started with three very broad questions. How complete are the data in the ad library? How accurate are the data in the ad library? And is transparency useful for finding misleading content? To get at those questions, we needed to start by looking at disclosure string accuracy. One of the cornerstone ideas of Facebook's new policies around political advertising is that users should be able to know who is paying to show them ads, and third parties like journalists should be able to find out who's responsible for a particular ad. For this to work, disclosure strings need to be consistently present and consistently accurate. So for that first question, 
we're trying to ask how complete are the data in the ad library? And a more specific version of that question is how good are advertisers at disclosing ads that meet the criteria for inclusion? So we can start by just looking at the number of pages with active political ads in a given week who are disclosing their ads and the number who are not disclosing their political ads. As we can see, while disclosing pages with active political ads follow a pattern one would expect of peaking right before an election and then falling back down, pages running undisclosed ads remain at a relatively steady level over the entire study period. And if we look at just undisclosed ads, after the first month of the study period, there is no upward or downward trend in the number of undisclosed ads in the library or the percentage. They're just kind of ticking along at a constant rate. So overall, we found that 54.6% of pages with ads in the ad library never provided a disclosure string. However, these advertisers only ran 5.4% of ads in the library. So this problem is more about understanding the ecosystem of political advertisers. Overall, just under 10% of ads in the ad library ran without a disclosure string. With these numbers, we do see a vulnerability for a civil attack, however. There are just so many pages that run undisclosed political ads for only a few weeks that it would be very easy for an advertiser to cycle through many pages running undisclosed ads on each of them in turn. So while most of the advertisers who did not disclose their ads ran a relatively small number, we also wanted to look at non-disclosing advertisers who ran many ads over a long period of time. We established some statistical cutoffs to find the largest, longest-lived non-disclosing advertisers, which you can find in the paper. And we found many pages which fell above the thresholds we established of $9,000 in spend and ran ads for more than 100 days. What we found is that the vast majority of those advertisers were commercial. However, among the other 20%, we found ads from the Xinhua news agency candidates, among others. So here's a quick look at ads from one of those non-disclosing commercial advertisers. This advertiser runs ads about guns, one of the topics for inclusion in the ad library, and to this day never discloses any of their ads. Occasionally they're taken down and added to the ad library, but usually they seem to run without interference. Here are some ads from China Xinhua News. Uh, none of these ads were disclosed. They're generally on issues of international relations. I must note here that we believe that it's not possible for Xinhua to register as a political advertiser, as that seems to be open to U.S. advertisers only. From everything we can tell, Facebook does no systematic enforcement of its disclosure policy on an advertiser basis, and it doesn't appear that advertisers ever get banned from running ads for systematically violating these disclosure policies. Okay, moving on. Given that there are some completeness problems, uh, how accurate are the data we do have? And again, to make this more specific, are the disclosure strings accurate enough to understand which entities are spending money on political advertising? So Facebook has a policy that disclosure strings must accurately represent the name of the entity responsible for the ad and not include any URLs or acronyms. We think this is a good policy. Disclosure strings in that form would allow researchers to tie ads to PACs and campaigns that report data to the FEC. Unfortunately, the accuracy of disclosure strings was not enforced during the study period. This was demonstrated by many journalists taking out ads claiming to have been paid for by prominent senators and so forth, and was also confirmed by Facebook. So given the lack of enforcement, we did attempt to quantify how well advertisers did voluntarily adhering to these policies. So validating the disclosure strings provided wasn't really in the scope of this work, but we did some work quantifying just the presence and formatting of these disclosures. I don't have time to get into details here, but we estimate that at least 17.7% of ads are incorrectly attributed in some way. And in a separate analysis, uh, we estimate that 23% of disclosure strings did not conform to the formatting standard. So please take a look at the paper if you're interested in the details of these analyses. So between the lack of enforcement and these more general errors by honest advertisers, we don't recommend disclosure strings be used to understand political ad spending. However, and this is a big however, in the fall of 2019, after receiving a draft of this paper, Facebook changed how disclosure strings are created. They're no longer a freeform text string. So we're hoping that they'll be useful in the future. 
So getting to the most important question, is transparency actually useful for finding misleading or misinformative content? And specifically, can we use the ad library to find potentially misleading content? To answer that, we're going on to our work looking at undisclosed coordinated activity in the Facebook ad library. So I wanted to start by showing you an example of disclosed coordinated activity. This is the same political ad creative spread across different Facebook pages aimed at very different identity groups, like African Americans, parents, or veterans. So this may look a little weird, but they are accurately disclosing the name of the payer in the disclosure string, so they're not misleading anyone. We wondered if there was more of this type of behavior where the advertiser attempted to obscure the coordination by not accurately disclosing who paid for the ad. We wanted to find coordinated activity that was not disclosed, which would violate Facebook policy. Since this content is very often not quite identical, changing out the name of a city or identity group, we use sim hashing, a locality sensitive hashing technique for texts, to find near duplicate ad texts as well as identical ones. More details on this are in the paper. So our ultimate goal is to find advertisers who are engaged in long-term, undisclosed, coordinated behavior. That means we're looking for pages that run near-identical content, claiming that it has been paid for by different parties, and do this repeatedly, not just once. So the first step of doing this is just to cluster those near-identical texts and establish statistical thresholds for a cutoff of a high number of pages and disclosure strings. Information on how we establish these thresholds is in the paper, but they are two or more pages and two or more disclosure strings. Next, we examine just clusters associated with uh, that two or more pages and two or more disclosure strings. We looked at how common it was for pages to run the same ad, and we found that when this happens, it usually doesn't repeat. So information on how we established this cutoff as well as in the paper, but we considered it an outlier if two pages ran the same content three times or more. And then lastly, we clustered together those pages that ran near identical ads three times or more. Overall, we found 172 clusters of advertisers that met the thresholds I've described for undisclosed coordinated activity. This was a small enough number that we were able to review them all manually and create categories for the different types of advertisers we observed. So I'm going to start with the benign types of this activity. Uh, we classified these advertisers as benign because there appeared to be no intent to deceive the viewer of the ad about who the payer was. In most cases, this appeared to be independent groups spreading the same content that had been created by a common party, but they all paid to show, to show it separately. So unfortunately, now I need to move on to case studies of some of the less benign patterns that we saw. So first, uh, we found corporate astroturfing. Um, this is pretty predictable and is certainly not unique to social media. We found 19 clusters of corporate astroturfing pages uh, with an average lifespan of 248 days and a total spend of $371,000. So here are ads from various citizens against lawsuit abuse groups that um, you know, try to appear to try to create the appearance of being a local grassroots group, but they're all they all sort of function together. Uh, we also found what was to us a surprising amount of dubious commercial activity, lots of scammy loan offerings, fake health insurance, overpriced investment products. We found 23 clusters of this type with a total spend of $13.6 million um, and an average lifespan of 199 days. So here's an example of that. These are um, kind of scammy loan offerings that are aimed at people based on their veteran status, or there are some that are tailored to each state. They're a little bit all over the place. And of course, this is the internet, so we found some clickbait. But here, I think it's interesting to note that we actually only found this in the early part of the study period. We hypothesize that Facebook took action against these advertisers and has been successful at preventing their activity. We base that not only on what we see in the data, but on the fact that they have made a couple of announcements to that effect as well. These advertisers have the shortest average lifespan of only 99 days, and by far the lowest total spend of only $60,000. And here's an example of, of what that looks like. It's usually just political in theme. 
So lastly, we found several inauthentic communities of the style that prompted us to initially look for this pattern of behavior. So we found 16 clusters of this type of activity with a total spend of 3.8 million and an average lifespan of 210 days. And that can look like a wide range of things. So here, clearly aimed at Republicans, this is um, that one of these pages is aimed at African American women. The other is aimed at union members. Um, here's an example of geographic specialization. One of these pages is aimed at uh, people in Virginia. One is aimed at people in Nevada. The last in Colorado. And here's an anti-Trump ad that's aimed at um, Ohio union members and uh, people in Pennsylvania. So. Um, what did we learn from all of this? First, we think transparency as a tool for mitigation of political disinformation holds real promise. However, much more is needed. And a lot of that is because tactics to spread disinformation are evolving rapidly. Transparency is going to need to evolve as well. Lastly, current enforcement efforts are just not yet sufficient to address the scope of the problem we're facing. We have two recommendations for the future. First, transparency systems need to be treated as the security systems they are. Much, much more work needs to go into enforcement. As they stand, these systems border on being voluntary. Specifically, we recommend that platforms building this system do enforcement on the advertiser level. We also recommend that a much stronger trust model of trust but verify be put into place. Second, we recommend that a third-party auditor for political advertising data be established. This would allow for independent oversight, uh, which I think our findings about unretrievable ads clearly show is necessary, and also ease cross-platform monitoring. If you're interested in access to Facebook ad library data, please contact Research at Harmony Labs. And now I think we can take some questions.